Thank you, Pastor Austin. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, uh, uh, Pastor James Weaver, and all of the other guys for giving me the opportunity to share with you again. Greetings again from Evangel University, from Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. Um, I need your students. I, I need some really good students. Come on, guys, shake them loose. Give me somebody to work with. Give me, give me some warm uh, bodies and some beating hearts, and uh, we'll see what God will do in terms of equipping them for their life's work and what God's got planned for them. Um, this morning, we had the opportunity to um, visit the day of Pentecost, looking at it from a little bit different perspective. What were people believing? H how were people practicing? What was being celebrated, not in the 14th century BC, but how, what was the emphasis in the first century AD? Um, and we saw that the, there was some interesting developmental uh, things and uh, then we saw where God met people right where they were on the day of Pentecost and Luke was even reflecting that kind of language when he was describing exactly what happened um, and I hope that that, uh, that that you appreciated that here's a, just a real quick recap of what we did this morning uh, that the, the festival of Shavuot weeks Pentecost um, was originally an agricultural celebration that then pretty quickly developed into a celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, especially under the in influence of the teachings of the Pharisees around the time of Jesus. And then that, that Mount Sinai event became the heart and soul of what Judaism would become then and now. Um, then we saw that Luke used that kind of language to describe what's happening in Acts chapter 2 as sort of a Christian Mount Sinai with all the phenomenology, with the wind, with the sounds, the voices, with the tongues, with the fire, etc. And we were seeing then that he was sort of framing that story in a way that Philo of Alexandria also framed this uh, giving of the law at Mount Sinai. I hope that you were able to follow follow along with the um, argumentation, the, um, uh, the discussion at that point. The application was the first century day of Pentecost became as focal a point for the first church um, as Mount Sinai, the actual original event, became for Judaism in ancient times. I uh, referenced, I threw up on the, uh, on the screen there, Acts 10 and also Acts 11 and Acts 15. In all three of those places, the argument in the early church is, if God has given to the Gentiles the Holy Spirit in the same way that he gave the Holy Spirit to us, so the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 became sort of a, rule a ruler, a yardstick, a, a, a standard of measurement that then they were applying not just to Jewish believers, followers of Jesus, but these new Gentiles that were coming in. And the argument is, if they received the Spirit the same way we did, then we should receive them in on equal standing. Thank God for that, because now we're not second-class citizens in our own kingdom, right? And so this standard of measurement, Acts chapter 2, was followed all the way through into the middle of the book of Acts, and the um, movement of the gospel out into the Greek and Roman world, ultimately reaching even us. It's a, it's, a, it's a formative moment. It's a central, a crucial moment. It's not something that, you know, was just, okay, that's a relic of a bygone era, or that was an exception to the rule, or, well, that was, that was then, this is now, or that was okay for them, but now for us, we've got technology, and we've got, you know, medicine, this, that, and the other, and whatever. Um, those are some weird arguments because Peter, at the end of this whole series of events in Acts 2, he says, this promise is to you and your children and all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And so you, if you've been called by God to a relationship with him, then that experience, that baptism in the Spirit, that empowerment, that divine enablement is available for you and just as relevant in the 21st as it was in the first century. Now, um, we should, as the body of Christ today, see this day of Pentecost and this experience of the outpouring of God's Spirit to equip His people as being just as central, just as definitive as Judaism has always understood the Sinai event. Okay. 
This is true for the church, we saw this morning, as it is true for you, the individual. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's relevant for you as a local body of Christ. It's relevant for you as an individual member of it. And Peter says this in Acts 2.39. It's to you, to you personally. It's to your children. So everybody that's afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And we, should, we also saw that this is not some kind of a bizarre, unusual event that's unique to a certain denomination or a certain kind of person or a certain uh, person with this educational level or this degree of commitment or this age or whatever. This is for all, uh, not just leadership, for everyone. And important for us to live out the calling of God on us to be a certain person, to live a certain lifestyle, and to accomplish certain things that he puts on our plate, that he calls on us to accomplish. Not in our strength, but that in that divine enablement that comes through this experience. Remember this passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you will be my witnesses. What comes first, the witnessing or the Spirit? Okay, that's, that's the appropriate kind of cadence of events. God's empowerment comes to enable us to do what he's called us to do. It's not bizarre. It's not some kind of a strange, weird experience that's just for certain super spiritual people. It's for the rank and file, the everyday, the average Christian, the, 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 the yous and me's of the world, uh, of the body of Christ. Uh, tonight, we want to look at a little bit different from uh, at Acts chapter 2, but from a little bit different perspective. Tonight, we're going to focus on David and David's son. And what part do David and David's son play in this uh, big drama that happens that's played out on the pages of Scripture in Acts chapter 2? Um, first of all, I want to again return to uh, the proposed location for these events. Because as you saw this morning, or at least I hope, maybe we can drill down a little bit more on that this evening, context is important. When you get a fax, when you get a telephone call, when you get a letter in the mail, when you, get, when you pick up and you go walk into your office, you see, or you're home, and you see somebody's left the voicemail, the thing is blinking, um, there's a context surrounding that communication. That's the way that human communication works. There's always going to be a context. In the world of the Bible, it's not any different at all. And God will condescend. He will stoop down and he'll meet people in biblical times, whether that's Abraham's day, Jesus' day, Paul's day, or whatever, and he's going to meet them right where they are. So there's always going to be this contextual stuff swirling around every Bible passage. Sometimes it has to do with weather pattern. Sometimes it has to do with agriculture. Sometimes it has to do with, with culture itself. Sometimes there's some kind of military or political or economic sort of context. Sometimes it's, it's history or sometimes it's the way words are used in ancient literature all around, not necessarily always in, but around the Bible as we saw today with Philo of Alexandria. Um, those things have to be taken into context. Our Bible is not like those golden plates that fell down out of heaven in Palmyra, New York, that Joseph Smith then deciphered, deciphered with his secret stones. There's no context there. There was only one copy, and those can't be found anywhere anymore. You know what I'm talking about, right? Our Bible has context, all those different kinds of context. It's a kind of a multi-tiered, very con contextualized, highly textured message, just like any other human communication. Can I give you an example? Just say yes. Okay, I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Um, I am a doctor, so please don't worry. <laughs> See what I did with that? Okay, not that kind of doctor. All right. One day I woke up and uh, sta uh, staggered to the breakfast table, and as I was eating my cornflakes, I noticed that there was a little handwritten note about this size right there at my spot at the table. And I picked it up, and I looked at it, and I read it, and it made absolutely no sense. I just assumed that I was still half asleep, finished up my cornflakes, read the note again, still didn't understand it. I knew it was from my daughter. I recognized her handwriting, 
And about that time, I began to hear Lacey. Um, Lacey, can you raise your hand just so everybody knows who you are? Okay, this is definitely real high. Come on, get it up. This is my better half. This is Professor Nunley, the other one at Evangel University. Biblical studies, social work. Okay, she actually teaches students to do how to do things that's re actually relevant. <laughs> so I hear Lacey stirring in, in, back in the back of the house, and I picked the note up, and I met her halfway down the hall. I said, "Honey." Abby wrote me this note, and, and I have read it twice. I don't really understand what it is that she's trying to get me to do. Believe me, if I could just figure it out, I would do it. I'm trying to stay out of trouble the whole time. Come on, guys, help me out here. All right, so um, she looks at it, and she goes, Oh, it's obvious why you wouldn't understand this. This note isn't to you. This note is to me. I, I, oh, really? Yeah, well, we had this conversation last night. This is just a real shorthand reminder for me to do what I promised her I said I would do. I didn't have context. She's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Speaks the same language, raised in the same culture, in fact, living in the same house. And I couldn't understand what she was trying to say because I didn't have the full, thank you very much. If that's true in the 21st century, is that not true 20 centuries ago? Or 34, going back to Moses, 34 centuries ago, right? Or 40 centuries going back to Abraham? Yes. Context is important. In real estate, there are three the, uh, most important rules. Some of you guys that are agents might know what I'm talking about. The three rules are what? Location. What's the second one? Location. And the third one is location. Okay, well, I've got three rules for you for Bible interpretation. Yes. And yes. And if you forget one, the other two will support you. Okay? will help you out in that. So I want to look at geographical context. Why? Because it's important. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting your time or mine. So when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, if we keep looking in the rearview mirror, we know that, that there were 120 of these folks. So you can't just get together any old where. All right? So this is a private home, but it can't be just a regular private home. It's got to be a palatial estate where you find those are on the western hill. If you go to the Western Hill, then you've got all kinds of these abandoned mansions that were once inhabited by the Maccabees or the Hasmoneans, the people who were ruling prior to the Roman uh, uh, coming to the land of Israel. Suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And this is just a standard word right, right here, not for temple, I don't think, because that's not the way Luke uses that word, but rather for a private dwelling, a big one, but a private one nonetheless. All right, so let's go back to that same satellite image that I um, put in front of you this morning and kind of retrace our steps. Main valleys are the Hinnom Valley on the west and south of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, see the blue line, forming the eastern side, and then the central valley running right up the middle. All that does, these two valleys do, is to sort of help us to understand the nature of the city of David right in here and the temple mount that was added by Solomon after David's death, where the temple was eventually built. You see the Dome of the Rock here today. Here's the Temple Mount, the, the um, trapezoid there, the southern steps that we're going to look at more closely. And all the way up here on the western hill um, are the locations of these Maccabean mansions, now deserted because Herod and the Maccabees, or the, the Romans, had gotten rid of all those guys. They didn't want any more trouble from them. All right, so here's another uh, perspective. We're up on the uh, Mount of Olives now. We're looking across the Kidron Valley, this deep gorge in front of us. And then you see the wall of the Temple Mount here and the city wall, at least as it was in the uh, early 1500s, stretching around on the southern side of the city. Right in this little niche, right, tucked right up in here, are the southern steps of the Temple Mount, uh, going, leading up into two main, en one entryway and one exit 
going up onto the temple proper. Here's the Dome of the Rock, Western Jerusalem out behind you. And up here is the area where the upper room, the traditional upper room is located even today. And pastor, that might be a location that we want, might want to, because of our, uh, the kinds of people that go, Pentecostal folks, folks from a Pentecostal church, we might just want to go to at least what is the traditional upper room and have a discussion of this uh, passage, Acts chapter 2 there. All right, now we're going to look from the other direction. We were up on this ridge, the Mount of Olives, Judean hill, uh, wilderness in the background, even a little sliver of the Dead Sea you can see right there. Um, Bethany is just back on the backside here. We were talking about that in the hour before this time. Kidron Valley in the shadow, the Temple Mount right here, Jeru all the city of Jerusalem right here, that central valley that kind of you can see the depression still there a little bit, and then the Hinnom Valley forming the western and the southern. All right? It's right over in this corner that you get today the Dormition Abbey, which is built right in the area of the uh, traditional place of the uh, upper room. This is the area of the southern steps right in here. In this whole shadow is what was once the city of David, which we'll be looking at more closely. In Acts chapter 2, we're told that there was Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound came, the multitude came together. So now we're talking about an event that started out as a private situation in a large palatial mansion that then moves out into the public arena. A multitude developed. Where, who are these multitudinous people? It's those people in Jerusalem and uh, who's come to Jerusalem from every nation for what purpose? To celebrate the festival of Shavuot, or weeks, or what we call by a Greek number, um, starts with a P. Yes, Pentecost. Thank you very much. The whole multitude came together. Well, where would a really large group of Jews from every nation under heaven, where would they be concentrated? Would it be up on the western hill in one of those uh, ex maccabean mansions? Would it be among the 120 who were filled with the Holy Spirit? Probably not. Where would you think that a major concentration of Jewish people who had made pilgrimage to the land of Israel, where would they be con con concentrated? At the temple, exactly. Okay, so that was that other circle, that area from the south going into the temple uh, courts uh, itself. This particular area right in here. Or if you're on this uh, screen, right in here. We're on the Mount of Olives looking across the Kidron Valley and onto the southern steps. More than likely at that bottleneck, this is where almost everybody that's just a regular, normal, everyday person is going to enter the Temple Mount from that direction. Before that, there are those 50-plus ritual immersion baths, we would call them baptistries, stretching all along that southern wall of, this, uh, of the temple and then even around the corner and along the western wall as you head toward what we call the, um, the western wall or the what some people still call it the wailing wall, although there's no wailing going on there because the Jews are in control since 1967. Um, and so uh, here we have it. That's the bottleneck. That's the concentration where people would be entering the Temple Mount. It's my thought that more than likely that is where this private event spilled out into the public arena. And here are those steps. You see the Mount of Olives right there behind? Okay. And this is the southern wall of the Temple Mount. You can even see the really large stones right there. They're taller than a human being. They're that, that large, put there by Herod the Great. Remember the guy that killed the babies in Bethlehem? The one that wanted to kill Jesus because he was challenging his rule over the Jewish people? This guy was a power broker, and he loved to build and impress people. So on all of his buildings, the master course, the one that people could walk, literally walk right up to and put their back up against, was always taller than a human being. And you'll have the opportunity when we're in Israel to, together, along with some of the um, members of your pastoral team, you'll have a chance to have your own picture taken there. How about a selfie right in front of Herod's temple? Wouldn't be a bad day at the office. It's just a suggestion. Note to self. 
Okay, these steps, you can, some of them have been replaced, but you can see some of the rougher part. Those are the original steps. Those are the steps that Jesus walked on. Folks who have been to Israel before, and I see quite a number of you guys already out there, when we finished our discussion on these steps right here, we, saw, we walked up those steps down this little walkway, and we showed you right in this area right here, we showed you a threshold stone, and that stone Jesus literally walked on. If he didn't, he couldn't have gotten into the temple. So he didn't just walk on it once. Jesus was in and out of the temple multiple times, yes? But just keep in mind that I'm always reminding people I'm happy for you to walk where Jesus walked. I'm even more interested in you walking like Jesus walked, okay? So grab any of these new hopers, any of these 50 years, any of these weakers. Is anybody in church this morning? Okay, um, just checking. That was mean, wasn't it? All right. Okay, never mind then. Strike, may it be stricken from the record. Ask any of these guys who have, who have been uh, there, and they will tell you, yes, you stand right on that stone. This is not a horseshoes and hand grenades. Maybe, hopefully, well, tradition says, no, this is the spot X marks the square. All right, so um, the teaching steps we hear about Gamaliel in rabbinic literature, sitting on these steps and dictating messages, letters. Do you remember anybody that studied under Gamaliel who also dictated his letters and sent them out to the four corners of the Greco-Roman world? I seem to, yes. I seem to remember Paul, kind of his star disciple. And we hear about both of these guys, both Gamaliel the teacher and Paul the student in the words of the New Testament. Okay, so this is, where, this, this, is, this is ground zero right here for Day of Pentecost realities. You imagine this place bustling with pilgrims, people trying to communicate with one another, and they're all speaking different languages, and they're trying to do business. Well, hey, I'll, I'll, I, I'll give you this m amount of change if you'll give me that amount of change so that I can do business on the Temple Mount with the right kind of currency. And I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, evidently, we don't speak the same language. Where, where exactly are you from? Oh, I don't know what you're asking me. I don't know where I'm from because I don't know what you're saying in your question to me. You see? day of Babel, right? And then the day of Pentecost comes and these, the, fully comes and these same people are going, wow, we're hearing about the marvelous acts of God, everyone in our own mother tongue. It's happening right here, okay? So here's a, a picture of the, um, uh, of the model of the temple. We use this as a teaching tool. It's about an acre in size and we're standing on a little parapet, but it's kind of like mimicking our place on the Mount of Olives. So let's just pretend that we're on the Mount of Olives, and you're looking over the Kidron Valley, and you're looking at the eastern gate of the temple. And then you're looking further in at the Gate Beautiful. Right? It, it, has God ever spoke Polish to you? Not once to me. I know that there are more than 10,000 articles written on the Dead Sea Scrolls in Polish, but that's not helping any of us, is it? Unless you have, you're of a certain ancestry and you remember that um, language from the mother country. God is speaking those people's language. What's on the forefront of their mind God brings right up to the forefront of this divine revelation and uses that to communicate with them. David was both born and died on the festival of Shavuot. Now, I want to remind you of this. Peter is going to say in this same sermon, yeah, David, our, the ancestor, he died and he's buried and he's still buried. The son of David died. He's not there anymore. And that's going to take them off into the direction of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on which all of our salvation is based. And it doesn't make any difference about nationality there. Brethren, I, I delivered unto you what was of, of utmost importance, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus was 
died for us in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and then on the third day he rose in accordance with the scriptures. And if those things aren't true, then we're still in our sins. We're of all men to be most pitied, and we are misrepresenting God if God didn't really raise him from the dead. Those things are important for you and me. Our forgiveness from our sins and our re relationship with God is predicated or based upon the death of the burial and the, um, of Jesus. So that's, that's Peter's entree into these most important components of what has come to be called the Christian faith today. So, David, born and died on the Feast of Pentecost weeks, Shavuot. Now, let's return to that passage yet again. David... This is, what, this is what Peter says. He died and he was buried, and then he says, and his tomb is still with us to this day. Now, where exactly would the tomb of David be? We have to trace this historically. Why is that? Inquiring minds want to know. We want to know this stuff. Look, when we're dealing with eternal things, horseshoes and hand grenades aren't good enough. We want to know, even as we are known. And so, in 1 Kings, we hear this. It's the first little geographical indicator that we get about the location of David's burial. And it says, David slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David. Now, what is exactly the city of David? We're going to look at that in just a moment. We've got to go back to those southern steps and move a little bit to the south. But let's look at Nehemiah for a moment. That's another indication. Nehemiah, the son of Osbuk, this is not the Nehemiah that wrote the book of Nehemiah. It's another Nehemiah. Um, he had the uh, official of half of the district of Betsur. He made repairs when they're rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And he built his as far as a point opposite the tombs of David. So in the days of Nehemiah, in the late 500s, early 400s B.C., in other words, about a half of a millennium after David died, people still knew where those tombs were, where the tomb of David and the tombs of his sons, the kings of, of the southern kingdom of Judah, where they were buried. As far as the artificial pool, ah, that gives us another point of reference. Some of you have already been there. I'm pretty sure that the reference here is to the pool of Siloam. It's on the very southern end of the city of David. We'll look at it in just a moment. Stick with me. Nehemiah. Now we come back to the writings of the rabbis, the material from the rabbis between Malachi and Matthew, and what they're saying here is the graves of the house of David, that means the dynasty of David, and the grave of Huldah the prophetess, who shows up in the uh, book of 2 Kings, and giving information to, giving guidance to the king of Judah in Jerusalem, and no one ever laid a hand on them. So the author of this text, or the uh, rabbinic authorities that are teaching this, they know that in their day, probably first century B.C., I'm thinking, that those tombs were still a well-known commodity inside of the city of David, a little sliver of the larger now city of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. They knew where those things were. In fact, everybody knew where they were, and no one had dared to lay a, lay a hand on them until. Now we come back to our old friend, the one we love to hate, Herod the Great. Josephus, first century Jew, contemporary of the apostles. We're not talking about some medieval tradition here. We're talking about a first century author, a guy who's writing his work at the same time the Gospels in our New Testament were being written. We did Philo this morning. Now I'm going to bother you with Josephus tonight. Josephus tells us a really interesting story about this Herod the Great guy. He says, Herod had spent large sums of money and he had heard that even earlier, Hyrcanus, one of the kings before him, had opened David's tomb and found 3,000 talents of silver from the much larger amount that was still stored there. So he had the idea of laying hands upon it. He was in need of funds. Kind of reminds me of our federal government. Never mind. Uh, um, 
Uh, next slide. And so one night he, Herod, opened the tomb and entered it, did so by night, taking precautions not to be seen by anyone in the city, but bringing him along only the most trustworthy of his friends. Unlike Hyrcanus, the earlier king, he did not find money stored there, but he did find many ornaments of gold and other valuable, valuable deposits, and he took all of that away. However, he was intent on making a more careful search and going farther and breaking open the very coffins of David and Solomon. See, in Herod's day, and Herod is the king who's, who's in charge at the birth of Jesus. We're talking about late first century BC, early first century AD reality. Herod is tr trying to get money because he's in need of this for his building projects from the tomb of David, which was still known in the first century. But since two of his bodyguards were destroyed, it is said, by flame of fire, uh-oh, we're back on that. Do you remember Philo and fire? Remember Acts 2 and fire? Uh, uh, Exodus chapters 19 and 20 and fire? Okay, so evidently there's some kind of a connection with fire going on around here, the city of David and this part of Jerusalem by a flame of fire that met them as they entered. In Acts chapter 2, we're said there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Not sure if there's a connection. It's just interesting that there, these two ancient texts are coming with the same kind of language. So, Josephus continues, the king himself became frightened, and as a propitiation, kind of like an offering, um, he built at the entrance of the tomb a memorial of white marble, at a huge expense also. Now, this structure is also mentioned by his contemporary, the historian Nicholas of Damascus. We're talking about a first century BC reality that continues on into the first century AD and the time of Jesus and the apostles. So now let's return to our uh, model. The city of David, this is the city of Jerusalem as it was in Jesus' day. This is the little city of David, just this. It's about six acres or so. Then Solomon added the Temple Mount on the north side. Here's the Pool of Siloam right here. This was that Central Valley we talked about, Kidron Valley, Hinnom Valley, yeah? So the city of David, we're looking from up here on the temple down to the end of the city of David where all these three valleys run together. A little narrow strip of land that David captured from the Jebusites back around the, in the 10th century B.C. Okay, here's what it looks like today. There's the, the bottom part of the Mount of Olives. This is the Kidron Valley right here. This is that little narrow city of David right here. And here is the Pool of Siloam. Okay, Pool of Siloam right there. City of David right here. Let me give you one more picture of it. All right, close up. Those are the gates. Here are the gates that, are, that were being used in Jesus' day uh, on the Temple Mount and the way that Jesus entered and exited the temple. You entered here and you exited there. These are the southern steps. This is the city of David. There's the Pool of Siloam, this time with no water in it. Okay, Pool of Siloam, city of David, Hold the gates going into the southern um, end of the temple. And now we have this, uh, Jerusalem as it exists again today with this outline being drawn around the city of David. Here's the Pool of Siloam right here. Kidron Valley, Central Valley. So those people that Peter's preaching to, that was why it was important for us to establish the location of these 120 preaching under the inspiration of the Spirit, speaking in tongues so that everybody could understand in their mother language, that happens at this bottleneck where you go, where you enter the temple, right here. Looking downhill, it's right in this area that four tombs have been found recently and have been connected to David and to his immediate ancestor, uh, immediate descendants. And so you can simply look downhill. So not only are the people in, on the day of Pentecost 
having David's birthday in mind and death day in mind, they are also able to see his tombs from where they stand just outside of the Temple Mount, looking straight downhill, less than six acres. Big, huge tombs, and this more recently, large marble, white marble structure built by Herod the Great to kind of appease God because he got in trouble and his bodyguards got killed trying to break into David's tomb, David's coffin. Interesting enough, that's the, that's the power of context. Textual context or literary context, geographical context, and historical context. Is God then condescending down to meet people again right where they are? Same way we saw this morning. He's communicating to them in ways that they can understand, using visual aids that they can literally see with their own two little eyeballs, if I can borrow from Disney's Robin Hood. What did David and his son know about the presence of God? David said in Psalm 16 that, that actually Peter quotes in this sermon, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or hell, nor will you abandon my soul, your holy one, to undergo decay. Using poetic parallelism, so that's the reason that I've spaced the words out like this. You've made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. It's the same thing as saying the ways of abundant life, of life lived in God. David knows about the presence of God. David's experienced the presence of God. David knew about the Spirit of God. It says when he was anointed by Samuel with a horn of oil, it said the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. What's interesting is John gives us this same look, just using different words, <clears throat> not about David, but about the son of David. When Jesus not was anointed with oil, but was baptized by John the prophet, it says that the Spirit remained upon him. From that day forward about David, remained upon him about David's son. Is that an interesting connection? And the definite connection is the Spirit, the Spirit of God. David knows about the Holy Spirit and about the Spirit of God. He knows this too. Not only can you enjoy the presence of God in the presence of his Spirit, but he also says, don't take me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So he, he knows this because he saw it happen to his Lord, his master, Saul the king, King Saul that David served. The, the same time the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, it says, but, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And David is begging God in Psalm 51, never let that happen to me, God. Never let me stray from your pr presence. Restore strengthen, encourage, refresh this, this fullness of the Spirit that I've been experiencing since the day Samuel poured that horn of oil on me and consecrated me as king. Jesus also knew about problems when the Spirit of God departs from a person. He says any sin can be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, well, that's another issue. That can't be. And by the way, if you're concerned about have you committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, read Numbers chapter 15 down toward the end of the chapter. It'll explain what that is. I've heard everything from um, adultery to cursing to whatever, um, murder even. And uh, I can tell you this, I'll give you a real quick hint. None of those are what the Bible describes in Numbers 15 as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Read Jesus' Bible, and you'll understand Jesus' words. It's as simple as that. The Holy Spirit, then. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. The Holy Spirit can be resisted, and the Holy Spirit can be sinned against. But guess what? I've got real good news for you. The Holy Spirit can also be obeyed, submitted to, worshipped, and have a relationship with God cultivated in the power of the Spirit. All of those are possibilities. Those are just as real as the negative side of the coin. Okay, shekel for y'all. So the takeaways are this. 
There's all kinds of different textured parts, pieces of this pie to provide for us context, culture, history, geography, ancient literature, and that kind of thing. You've seen that illustrated in both the morning and the evening message tonight. I want to encourage you to jump in. The context water is fine. And that's from the kiddie pool all the way to the deep end where the big kids dive off the board. Just jump in anywhere you are. I don't know where to start. Buy you a used Josephus online and just start reading. Put it on the back of the potty and make a, make a commitment. I'm reading this, all, all of it, this whole, at the, by the end of the summer, I've got Josephus done. I did it, it happened. It works. The more we understand of context, then the more we understand scripture. We get into the mindset of the original actors. Interestingly, we start walking into the pages of history into the pages of the Bible, we become part of the story. We become a part of those chapters, those passages that we're reading. We understand it, not from an outsider perspective, but from an insider perspective. In other words, you had the background, the context behind the note at the breakfast table that morning. God communicates to each group, every culture, every generation in ways that we can understand that powerfully impact us. He was doing that on that day. Remember all of that stuff about the phenomenology and about all the different practices that it developed and language that was being used even by a contemporary of the New Testament, Philo? Okay, now today, we, tonight we've been talking about, yeah, they were also celebrating David's death and David's uh, birth. And David's tomb is right there in front of him that could be pointed to, as Jesus did when he was there, by Peter when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Context puts us right into the story. God has blessed us with many convincing proofs. Guys, look at this. In Acts 1-3, the Bible says that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he presented himself to his disciples with many convincing proofs. But guess what? God wasn't finished with Jesus and his original disciples. He's showing us by stuff coming out of the ground every digging season. In fact, every week almost, it seems like, we're getting bombarded with new discoveries that have d direct impact to our understanding of the Bible and of the Bible's message being confirmed over and over and over again. Digging season after digging season, excavation after excavation. It is, we are living in truly exciting times. Now, what's even cooler is when you can literally see it with your own two eyeballs, not through CNN, not through Fox News, and not just through some news feed that you have on your computer screen, but you're looking at it face to face. When you've got your uh, face right up to within inches of one of the most important Dead Sea Scrolls, that's when things begin to pop. Please don't uh, deny yourself. Give in to that internal desire to return to the land of your roots and get connected to your Bible in a way that you never even dreamed possible. God has given to you and me, 21st century, many convincing proofs. And I love that. He's left us with excellent role models, people like David and especially the son of David. And then he has empowered us with his spirit to walk along the lines of those incredible biblical examples left for us. Bottom line is this, though. None of this is possible. I ended here this morning with this very scripture. None of this would be possible without that central centerpiece of Christian faith, and that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Without the forgiveness of sin, there is no relationship with God. With no relationship with God, there is no hope of heaven. Jesus the crucified, buried, and resurrected Messiah is the centerpiece of all of this. All this presence of God, all these gifts of the Spirit, all of this empowerment, infilling, in equipping by the Spirit is only possible because of Jesus' sacrifice. Praise His name. Yeah. Would you take a moment and pray with me tonight as we conclude? Pastor Jeff, please. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. 
Thank you so much, Lord, that you who were in the image of God emptied yourself and became a servant and humbled yourself to obedience and death on a cross. And I thank you, Lord, because of that, that God highly exalted you. I thank you that you have been raised from the dead. And because of that, we also will be able, to, we are able to expect resurrection ourselves and eternity with a living God who is the author of abundant life here and there. Thank you for context, Lord. Thank you for many convincing proofs, Lord. Thank you not just for David, but even more for the son of David. Thank you, Lord God, for all of this beautiful word that you've given to us that's not only a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, but it is a trustworthy, proven, tried, and abundantly witnessed to set of documents that we can indeed place our eternal destiny, our hope for, uh, of glory in the future on the basis of those documents. We give you praise for it. In the name of your awesome son, Jesus of Nazareth, and God's people at New Hope Church said, amen.